en amana en areo en a ibi erao danga tirama tena koto tena koto tena koto katoa o te fata lo fatu ilema pa ia ma le ma malu o afia mai irene tayao talofa talofa lava so I welcome everyone i started off with greeting you in te reo maori and my native language samoan because they're two beautiful languages but also because when I speak them, it gives me that little bit of strength that I need to stand before you here today. Public speaking isn't my favorite thing to do. But also, it helps me more than some of the tips that I got through preparing for this talk. One of them which was to imagine everyone in their underwear. <laughs> um, but standing here, I feel a little bit uh, conspicuous, self-conscious, out of place, a little bit weird. So these are some of the things also that I have felt throughout my career. Working in design and technology, I've been the only woman in the room, the only brown face, the one who looked different and sounded different, um, always trying to fit in and to find my place. And the stats reflect my experience. Women make up less than 30% of the technology workforce here in Aotearoa, and Pacifica sits at about um, 3%. I couldn't find any concrete statistics for the design uh, industry, but my guess is that it's pretty much the same. Probably better on the women um, side, but not so much in the Pacifica. Like many of us in the minority, I have experienced all forms of racism and discrimination in the workplace. Experiences not spoken of and not gone unnoticed by the majority. I've held an equivalent role um, to a male counterpart, but been on uh, a lesser grade and pay. I've been told that I speak English really well, considering. Considering? <laughs> considering what? <laughs> Um, when applying for jobs earlier on in my career, uh, I, haven't had, I didn't have a lot of luck. Um, and a recruiter suggested to me that perhaps I consider changing my name to a more English sounding one. Um, how about something like Sandra or Sasha? He said, helpfully or not so helpfully. Um, it's just one letter difference. Yes, Mr. Recruiter, it is just one little difference, but it is the name that was gifted to be by my parents, and kind of it, it also encompasses my whole heritage. Sachi is short for Sachiko, which means bliss and joy. Why would I want to change that um, name? So these signals, both small and big, would whisper to me, you are different, you don't belong. And my response, I made myself really small, put my head down, and got to work. And I became really good at it, so much so that I started to uh, rise through the ranks. My foray into leadership, though, was a bumpy one. I was so chuffed to be at the leadership table with all these people that I respected, admired, and aspired to be. And oh, how I struggled. <laughs> I did not have a great time. I struggled to participate. I struggled to be heard. I struggled to embrace my place. But I couldn't figure out why. Um, I had this niggling feeling that I was different, that I thought differently, that I processed information differently, and I expressed myself in different ways. And by the time that I had formed kind of my perspective, the conversation had moved on. I brought this up um, with my manager at the time in our one-on-ones. I shared how I was struggling, how I wasn't enjoying the role, how I thought that leadership wasn't for me. They would exclaim, but Sachi, you bring color. Hello. <laughs> reinforced, but that just reinforced the fact that I was different. They explained how they had also struggled. They had gone through the same experience they had graduated from the School of Hard Knocks. They had made it to the top, and all I had to do was do the same. I had to grow a thicker skin, be stronger, speak louder. I wanted to make them proud, and so I gave it my best shot. Outwardly, I was going through the motions of what I thought a good 
leader should be. And to be honest, I, I did well. But inwardly, I was slowly losing who I was. I felt like a fraud, constantly second-guessing myself. I was editing myself to fit into an acceptable mold, and in smoothing away my unique edges, I lost my edge. You see, in the workplace, particularly within design and technology, we, our beacons of success are usually the people who have climbed that mountain of achievement. Our managers, our leaders, our senior executives. And when you see success through the values and the norms of the behaviours of the people in the majority, it's understandable why people like me, who don't quite fit in, uh, feel pressured to conform in order to get ahead. In my 25 plus year career in design and technology, all my managers have been Pakeha. I've never had anyone who looked like me or acted like me. My manager's well-intentioned advice was to give me the tools that they had used and thought that I needed to get ahead. And um, here's the thing. I didn't have to climb that mountain using my hands and feet like um, others. I had to realise that I had wings and that I could fly. My, continually, my continual self-editing of myself was perpetuating the very norm that I was so desperate to change. And to make meaningful change, I had to start with me. Let me take you back to 1941 and to this man, President D. Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States. This is a story of a moment in history, a moment which caused a ripple effect that impacted the generations of my family. You see, um, you see back in uh, December 7, 1941, the Japanese um, staged a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, decimating the US um, Pacific Fleet. At the time um, of the attack, about 120,000 Japanese um, residents lived in, in the US mainland. About two-thirds of them were full American citizens. Amongst them were my grandparents and my two uncles. Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> Following the attack, a wave of anti-Japanese uh, suspicion and fear swept through America. One of President Roosevelt's first acts was to commission a report into investigating the loyalty of the Japanese-American community. The Munson Report, as it was called, uh, as it became known, found out there was no threat of armed insurrection or any other sabotage amongst the largely loyal um, Japanese community. Many of them have never been to Japan and a lot of the younger generation couldn't even speak English. However, the hysteria continued to fan the flames of fear and um, hatred and despite reservations, even from his most senior advisors at the time, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. The ex executive order for forced all Japanese Americans to leave their homes and properties and move into concentration camps, often located miles and miles away from their homes. The Italians and Germans were also at war with America at the time, but only the Japanese were rounded up. Families were only given days notice to vacate their homes and abandon their businesses, and they were only able to take what they could carry. Living conditions in these makeshift camps were terrible. The army-style barracks that were built offered little protection to the heat and to the cold um, of the environment. There were reasons why people didn't actually live in this, these places. My grandparents were stripped of everything, their land, their home, their belongings, and they were carted to a location miles away from where they lived and where they had never been before and they were left there for four years. It is in one of these camps that my mother was born. I've always been really curious about that um, experience and my family's ordeal. 
Where were they when they found out the news? What did they take with them when they were only allowed to pack a whole house full into one bag? How did they feel? And how did my grandparents explain all this to their young children? I say I can, I can only imagine because um, once my mother and her family left the concentration camp in Poston, Arizona, they never spoke about it again. Most of what I've learned has been through research of my own and I was struck by this uh, story that I came across um, about an essay that Marcy Yamano had written and submitted in college in the 1980s. It came back from, she tells a story about how it came back with a big red if uh, marked on it with a remark from her professor, you made this all up, it did not happen. So not only were they subjected to these awful uh, atrocities, they were denied any acknowledgement um, and kind of written out of history. My, parent, my grandparents took on the mantle of dutiful citizens, moved on, worked hard and tried to make their way in the great American dream. They put their head down and got on with it, but they never ever got over the shame. Con outcast, out of place, different, weird, uncomfortable, unwelcome. These intense feelings of not fitting in had been passed down through the generations to me, and it had a name, intergenerational trauma. Shame and fear. What I understood as I navigated my whakapapa there was that these two feelings, shame and fear, were intricately woven into who I was as a person, and they were wrapped up in a bow of a strong longing to, do, to belong. Yes, the world isn't a level playing field and there are process and, place, um, process and policies and structures that will hold us back in life. These are the realities. But my biggest learning as a leader and as a human being is that to create any kind of meaningful transformation or change in society, in your organization, or in your own life, you have to start with introspection. And often that requires you to navigate through fear and shame. But it's worth it, and when you do it and you come out the other end, um, there's a lesson around looking back in order to move forward. So when my mother graduated from uni, she joined the Peace Corps and was one of the very first groups who journeyed across the world. She was sent to Samoa um, and it was there that she met my father and was swept off her feet. Aren't they cute? I think they're so cute. They're actually like little <laughs> She fell in with the Samoan culture. She fell in love with the Samoan culture, embraced it as much as it embraced her, gravitated to the sense of community and connection to the land, the people, and, and um, the culture. And it was here that I, that I spent most of my life um, in Samoa until I came overseas for university. Many of us navigate this dichotomy, the contrasting sides of the same coin, navigating to, between these two worlds. And it was when I did that introspection, um, I found my point of differentiation, my point of view, which is shaped by that connection and sense of community and culture that I get from my Samoan side, and my real deep empathy and capacity for empathy and compassion from my Japanese side. And once I understood that about myself, why would I want to be anybody else? Now that I lead a team of my own at ANZ, I feel a huge responsibility to create a team culture based on equity, openness, and a sense of belonging, the very environment that I wished for myself. I, I know I wanted to create a place where people from all walks of life could feel at home, and I think we're on to a great thing. So I wanted to share with you today a three key learnings um, from, our, learn from our, our journey so far. I've taken the acronym DEI, which usually stands for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and um, done a little spin of my own.
D stands for define. You have to start with de defining what diversity means for your team. For us, we knew that we wanted our team to reflect, um, to shape a world, a shape a team that was representative of Aotearoa. This was our definition of a diverse workforce. We took the time to look at our current makeup, and then we compared that to the wider social context um, of New Zealand. I like to use the analogy of putting together um, a jigsaw puzzle, where you start with putting the borders up first, and then you create, start creating that picture with all the, the rest of the puzzle, puzzle pieces. There comes a point in time where you're hunting out that particular um, piece. It could be a shape, or a, a shade of colour, or a pattern. Um, you have to know what you're looking for in order to make your team diverse. And there are many, many, many different um, amazing designers out there, but we knew we were looking for particular pieces of the puzzle in order to make our picture. We knew, for example, that we had a lack of Māori and Pacific uh, represent, representation within the team. Māori and Pacific in Aotearoa make up about two quarter, uh, 25%, a quarter of the population. In our team, we only had two Pacifica members at the time, myself and one other, and we had no Māori um, representation. We also lacked um, junior roles, and this is not surprising in an organisation where you're trying to embed design. You often start with senior um, designers because you need them to hit the ground running. Um, but we recognised that we had no entry-level positions and also career progression um, was non-existent at that time. We also, most of the people in our team had come externally from ANZ um, and we were lacking that internal business acumen, internal knowledge that comes from having worked at a large corporate bank. So these were the gaps in our puzzle that we were seeking to fill. And as you can see from the, the slide, we were successful in, in placing um, or filling most of the gaps within the team. E starts for effort, which is a representation of how hard it actually is to do this type of work to create diversity and inclusion within your team. I thought I could be like Kevin Costner in the movie uh, Field of Dreams. So I'm giving away my age here because this movie is about 30 years old. But for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a movie about an, a farmer who hears in the middle of the night a mysterious voice saying, build it and they will come. And so he builds this baseball field, uh, baseball um, pitch in his cornfield and these ghosts of baseball legends of past appear. Um, it, is, it sounds like a weird movie, but it's actually quite good. <laughs> um, so I thought the same. If once we decided that here are the gaps, Māori and Pacific were one of them, I'm Pacifica, all I had to do was say it and they would come. So I posted about it on LinkedIn a couple of times. Anyone who's Māori and Pacific would be great if you came and joined our team. And then I sat back and waited and waited and waited. There were uh, lots of applicants, but none of them were Māori and Pacific. So that was my first learning. I couldn't just sit. I had to get to work. We had to be creative about how we um, were letting know, uh, people know about our roles. Um, the normal avenues of LinkedIn and Seek are great, um, but we often, we, we knew that the people that we were looking for often weren't looking at, at job ads. Perhaps they weren't even looking for a new opportunity. We invested time and effort into developing partnerships with local design schools, um, networking events, went to do many of them, and we also looked at a partnership with the Ministry of Social Development. Referrals also played a big part. Our team reached out to their own networks of friends in, um, in the industry. And our recruiting leaders shared, did a lot of work in sharing people that they were meeting with and kind of um, referring them to others within the team. They all had a view of what we were looking for across the, the, the board. And then as a leader, I had to pick up my game. 
I had to be more visible. I had to use my voice, be seen. I had to share my view of the world and the issues that were important to me. And, and, and also kind of paint the picture of what it was like to work in the team and for an ANZ, because people want to know. Um, and the response from this was overwhelmingly positive. So we increased our team from 11 to 40 in the space of 10 months, but the work there wasn't done. We had to create an inclusive environment or culture, and that had to be done by the team itself. The central theme, though, throughout this was you have to connect to yourself and your strengths first and foremost before you can connect with others. And as a team, so as a team, we dedicated time and effort into making available tools like disk profiles and the Clifton Strength Finder, and we did them all together. I've been part of teams where you were given these tools and you kind of did them on your own, but we made a really intentful um, step towards ensuring that everyone did them together. Each designer is encouraged to delve into their natural working styles and understand how to amplify their own strengths. We have workshops and sessions where they share this information with each other and work out you know, um, how to work together. This also comes in really handy when you're putting a team together and you kind of know the different perspectives and strengths that you need within that team. Sometimes you hear things like, I'm aware that I'm showing my eye tendencies here with this conversation. What do some of the C's in the room think? And so you kind of get this really funny convo, um, which is really playful. Um, we also have a number of initiatives aimed at bringing people together to find commonality and, and connection points. And one of the most exciting one is that we're introducing Te Ao Māori into the way that we work and design. So the results are really incredibly um, positive. The team often speak of the culture as the biggest contributor to their enjoyment at work. And it's evident in the way that they design, uh, design and collaborate with others. So the effort, which has been a lot, is paying off. The last letter I stands for integrity and um, I wanted to use this to reference some of the leadership alongside me in this team. It's super important to have leaders who care. Um, I wanted to shout out to my wonderful leadership team. They believed in the cause as much as I did, helped shape the approach, challenged our thinking, got stuck in and supported each other um, throughout. They stepped up when the going got tough, and it did at times because, as you can imagine, introducing 30 plus new people into the team about around the same time is not the best thing to do. I would recommend that <laughs> by any means. But they listened to the team's feedback and they learnt and they took the necessary steps um, to remedy some of the pain points. And throughout they have been my number one support crew, allowing me to be vulnerable and practice some of my own learnings around leadership with them. Some of them have been with me for a while and they will tell you that, that they have seen the evolution arc of my leadership style. I reflect now and I'm such a different leader than I was 10 years ago and that's a great thing. Um, so to Jet and Lauren and Scott and Ruth, who's here today and speaking tomorrow, um, Charlie, Bob and Angeline, Ngā mihi nui ki koto. They're not here today because they actually gave up their place for someone, um, other people within the team. But I could not have, we could not have had them, um, done this without them. So why is this whole push for diversity, and equity, and inclusion so important to me and to the team? Well, I think because it does show up in the way that we design in the way that we insist research is done with diverse customer um, groups. It shows in the way we advocate for accessibility when no one else is. And it, it shows up in the way we try to understand the problem from different perspectives first before we delve in. 
and most importantly, it shows up in the way that we treat each other as a team and the relationships that we build with our stakeholders. I wish we had time for me to show you some more concrete examples of some of the work, but um, that might have to be for another talk, and maybe perhaps one of the team can, can stand up here instead. So I think I've changed my thinking uh, around the, being the odd man out. Perhaps it isn't so bad after all. Actually, it isn't. Because maybe it just means, well, maybe it does mean that you're the first to step out into a space. And as Mel Streep um, says, it takes grace and grit to be the first. So um, I find my grit to stand here not in doing that superwoman pose in the bathroom 15 minutes before the talk. Um, I close my eyes and I think about my loved ones, the ones who went before me, my grandparents on both sides, who migrated to new lands in search of fresh, fresh beginnings, who struggled and endured and persevered because they hold, held on so greatly to a dream meant for me, for me to stand up here and use my voice. So I must prosper and do better. I must not make, well, I must not take their struggles in vain. And when you have that um, courage behind you to shape you, the, the, your own space in which you belong, nothing can stop you. Thank you for listening to my story. Um, I have enjoyed standing in front of you here today. Yeah, Manuela Tatuaso, which means let's have a great day. Soy fu lover.